Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone's doing okay on this uh, this Thursday right before Christmas. It is my pleasure to uh, welcome you to our webinar on recruiting and retaining top talent. My name is Jennifer Matthew. I am the director of ADR for Alaris. So this CLE has been approved for 1.2 hours in Missouri, one hour in Arkansas, and one hour in Kansas. So I just have a couple of housekeeping items and then I will turn it over to our speaker today. Um, for those of you who are seeking credit in Kansas, we will have two polls uh, throughout the webinar. If you could answer those polls and record your answers, that would be great. Um, and then we'll collect that information to prove that you participated today. Um, I'm happy to uh, announce that next month we have a CLE on January 13th. It's gonna be at noon. Uh, our presenters will be Judge Rex Burleson and Judge Michael Stelzer uh, from the circuit court here in the city of St. Louis, and they'll be presenting uh, an update on the circuit court in the city. So again, that is January 13th. The registration is open um, on our website, which is alarisadr.us. Um, so after the webinar today, you will receive a survey. We are always looking for ways to improve. And fair warning, we will share the comments with Jamie. So hopefully that's all right with you, Jamie. Um, and you will receive a certificate of attendance as well. So those are usually sent out within about 48 hours of the, the webinar. And for those of you, I didn't look, but if you're joining by phone only, if you could please send your name, um, send an email to marketing, and that is marketing at alaris.us, just to ensure that we know who you are. Um, and then lastly, the Q&A link at the bottom there, if you have anything that you would like to submit a question or comment or thought, uh, please use that. I know Jamie is very interactive um, and she will um, answer as many questions as she can. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Jamie Hall. Um, Jamie has been in the legal industry for over eight years. She started by leading a 100 plus person uh, back office for a global litigation firm as the CEO. She helped to grow this firm from a 22 state presence to over 40 states and the UK in six years, as well as reduce turnover and improve financial performance. Legal Back Office launched in 2018 because of the need in the industry to help smaller firms become more successful. Legal Back Office is passionate about helping attorneys build a successful business. So LBO, as we call it, uh, powers the business of law by offering strategic planning and consulting, as well as outsourced accounting, marketing, and HR services to small and mid-sized law firms across the U.S. And if you know Jamie, none of that is a surprise that she was able to accomplish um, and start this new, this new business, which you just celebrated, I think, was it your second anniversary, is that right? Yeah. Um, and so, uh, Jamie, I'm happy to call you a friend. Uh, we were very fortunate to meet a couple of years ago at a bar conference. Um, she is, I, I try to think of some words to describe you, and I thought of vivacious, oh. Oh. driven, and uh, you're caring in the sense that you truly want to improve the legal landscape um, and helping all of us be the best we can be. And you and I have had conversations about that exact topic, and you genuinely walk the walk. So without oh. further ado, thank you, Jamie. Thank you. I really appreciate that introduction. Um, I really do. It's it's true. I care so much. And I, you know, I am, um, my background has always been in professional services, um, but legal industry, you know, eight, eight years, I know compared to many of you probably doesn't sound like a lot of years, but I've just grown incredibly passionate about supporting this industry and, and helping our lawyers to be more successful. Um, and we even have a couple of uh, mediation clients as well. So um, I will say, I think where that sort of caring nature maybe started was I'm a mom of four. I have four children, um, an almost 12 year old, 10, seven, and three. So have quite a lot going on in my house. I can, I like mentioning that because, you know, we are humans and who we are um, personally and professionally um, oftentimes intertwine. And so I can very much relate to the challenges that come, you know, with uh, especially being in a global pandemic and having to do homebound learning and run a company and make payroll and all the things. And so I can certainly relate to what it's like to have a pretty busy household. My really fast background is I was uh, I had a, a degree, my undergraduate degree is in acting and directing for the theater. Go figure, right? It's the funniest fact I think about me. Um, I actually went back to school to teach high school speech and drama, had an event planning and wedding planning background, ended up in HR, and then the CEO of a multi-million dollar company within 15 years. 
right? Totally normal, totally normal career progression. And what I found in sort of running the back office of that large global litigation firm was that, you know, there's such a market in the legal industry for small to mid-sized firms that are really struggling every day to build and run these successful firms. And I hear it all the time. You know, I learned in law school how to practice law, but I didn't learn how to run a business. And yet it's like 95% of the industry is 20 or less lawyers <laughs> in terms of size of firms. And so we are an industry that is predominantly made up of entrepreneurs. Um, that never got a background or an education in how to actually run a business. And so certainly one of those components of having a su successful business um, and, you know, successful law firm is being able to find really great people and then being able to keep those people and keep that talent. So I'm really excited to be presenting on this topic today, especially since my background, you know, um, in corporate America really is in HR. So, you know, I've been in sort of touching this cultural component and this recruiting component really since about 2006. So I have a lot of experience in trying to understand um, from the inside out, frankly, is how we recruit best. And I think if I was going to say high level, I want to encourage you all to think differently about recruiting and retention as we currently usually think about recruiting as being all external. How do I find the people that are out there to bring them in here? And I think we need to flip that script. How do we become who we're supposed to be in here? And then the people out there will come to us instead of us having to go and find them. So I hope to emphasize today a, a balanced approach to both some HR best practices when it comes to recruiting, and then also some pretty... Um, maybe squishy and ethereal, but very important cultural elements that we can do to help keep those employees and those, those ta that talent uh, long-term. So some of the things I'm gonna be walking through today, and you probably saw when you signed up for the webinar, are you know number one, it's really important that we create a culture um, that supports our firm and our companies being an employer of choice. If a candidate has multiple job offers or multiple opportunities, we want them to choose us. I say this all the time in marketing, and it makes a lot of sense in marketing, right? We want potential clients that are going to use our services to choose us more often than they choose our competitors. We need to think about it in the same terms as an employer. How can we become this employer of choice where more lawyers want to work with us than those that don't? Or they're going to choose us over choosing to work for this other firm that does the same practice area down the road. Down the road. Secondly, I want to talk a little bit about tools um, and some resources that are available to ensure that we are hiring effectively. A lot of times hiring comes out of extreme need and not proactivity. Can I get an amen? Someone else leaves or there's an influx of business um, or a partnership breaks up or, or someone's out on a, on a maternity leave or a me an unexpected medical leave and we've got all this work that needs to get done, we need someone in here like now. And a lot of times, unfortunately, needing someone now doesn't always result in the best hires. So how can we really create a hiring strategy that really is utilizing some tools and resources to make sure we're hiring the right people and not getting sucked into that cyclical pattern of hiring fast but hiring wrong, training and then losing the person or having to get rid of them and then having to hire again. I also want to spend some time talking about employers as a brand. Um, when we talk about branding, I think instantly, especially in our industry, this is what we get big eye roll, right? Like, oh, not those marketing people again. Um, but brand really is just who you are. Who are you as an employer? When people hear Alaris, what do they think of? When people hear Thompson Coburn, what do they think of? When people hear Hush, they instantly think of a sort of culture. And especially when you're in this industry and even within a particular market, you know what the culture is like at those firms because you have relationships. That is your brand. When people can say, oh, you just have to know you are going to be hitting the grindstone at this particular firm. And if you're comfortable with that work and that work hard, play hard, get good results, get 
get paid in the long run, that's fine. If you need a work-life balance, you're probably not going to be working at certain firms. That's your brand. That's who you are. And so we need to get better at how do we sell the value of our brand as an employer to those prospective candidates. Um, and I also think people um, underestimate the value of a good onboarding process. It takes so much time and effort to get the right people hired. Once we get them hired, then we think, oh, we just got to get them in the door. Well, then they get in the door uh, and it's a little shaky. No one knows they're coming. Or maybe one person knows they're coming. They don't know who they are, what they're supposed to be doing. There's no agenda. Who's training on what? They don't have the access they need. They don't have the equipment they need. That is not leaving a good first impression. We all know first impressions matter. They matter not just to the employer, but to that new employee coming in the door. If I can change your mindset at all by the end of this session, I'm hoping that you realize that what your candidates and employees think of you is equally or more important than what you think of them. And I think that guides a lot of our decision-making in recruiting and in our culture that we get that reversed. So keep that in mind. When our new employees come on board, we want them to have an onboarding process that is smooth, maybe not perfect, but is smooth, that gives them the tools they need, the education they need to help them to be successful. And lastly, I think it's really important that we commit to making a workplace that <sighs> culture really is key. If people want to stay, if they like working there for a lot of different reasons, those reasons could be different based on every single, every single firm, you won't have to be hiring nearly as often. We've all heard of the cost of turnover, and it is incredibly high. And taxing, not just in a dollar sense, in an emotional sense, opportunity costs through your time, through continually having to train, and then all the damage that is done to your reputation in the marketplace when people continue to leave. So creating a culture in which people want to stay, and not only do they want to stay, now they're telling all of their talented friends that they need to come work there. And now you've just sped up your hiring process and made your people your best recruiting ambassadors. So let me talk about culture as a business strategy really quickly. Quick reminder about the Q&A box. Um, I really do love engagement. Don't mind being interrupted at all. So use that Q&A box. I'll be watching it sporadically. If you do want to pop in or share anything, even if it's not a question, just a statement, feel free to engage with us in that way. Sometimes I think, especially in our industry that's very technically driven, um, we don't feel comfortable talking about culture. And that's because it feels mm, squishy. Is that the right word for it? Because it's hard to define, right? It, culture is not two plus two equals four. Culture is you put together a set of beliefs and how you want people to feel and act within your environment. And we don't know how to define feeling all the time or how to create feeling. And so rather than spend time talking about culture and figuring it out, we just dismiss it as being, oh, that's fluffy. You know, that we don't need to worry about that. Well, culture matters, and I'm hoping to prove that to you today. Um, when you get a copy of this PowerPoint, all of the green text is um, hyperlinked. So if you'd like to go look at these references or read the full articles, you're welcome to. Um, I can tell you that um, just researching this a little bit, um, you will find a lot more statistics than what I've shared with you today and a lot more resources. So the Department of Economics at the University of Warwick found that happy workers are 12% more productive than the average worker. And unhappy workers are 10% less productive. In fact, unhappy employees cost American businesses over $300 billion each year. That's not fluffy, if you ask me. <laughs> Those are real dollars. And if we're all being honest with ourselves, we've all been in positions before where we just didn't really love the work we were doing, or we didn't really like the place that we were working. We know what that feels like. I've actually found a lot in small to mid-sized firms. Many times these lawyers are starting these firms because they're trying to get away from a culture that they didn't want to be a part of. Culture really does matter. The New Century Financial Corporation indicates that employees who are actively engaged in their jobs produce better results. For instance, account executives at a banking company who are actively disengaged produce 28% less revenue than those that were engaged. On the other hand, companies with happy employees outperform the competition by 20%. 
Um, I'll take that. I would much rather outperform my competition by 20% and have happy employees and engaged employees. This last one I think is pretty important. More than 75% of employees who say they have good healthcare benefits also report high job satisfaction. And 71% of those workers are loyal to their employers. I'm mentioning this because culture is not just about fluff. There are certain like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. People need to earn an income that they feel good about. They need to be taken care of in terms of their medical benefits, time off, mental health. These are all sort of some foundational elements that do help perpetuate a positive culture. So I'm only mentioning this because it's not enough to say, oh, well, people really like working here, um, but we don't provide time off, paid time off. We don't provide benefits. We don't pay for holiday pay, but we give people a lot of flexibility. So it's all fine. Don't discount the importance of core things that make you competitive as an employer in medical benefits and time off and other sort of ancillary benefits. So I hope some of these statistics at least prove to you that culture really does matter and does have an impact on your results. I wanna just walk through a couple of culture best practices because I think some people hear that word and they don't even know really where to start or what does that even mean? And what I find most common in this industry is that there really is a lack of mission, vision, and values in law firms. Something that we kind of take for granted, I think, in corporate America and in the business world is you can't even have a company without a mission, vision, and values. And yet we've got all these law firms that have no defined mission, vision, and values. So let me share with you really quickly what those are, because I think they really do help create this culture in which we want people to be attracted to us and to stay. So your mission is why you do what you do every day. You know, what is it that you're doing every day? Your values are who you are and how you go about that everyday work and that mission. And your vision is really what you want to achieve in the future. So when the mission is clear for candidates and for employees, they understand how to focus their day that is going towards that mission. Your values guide who you hire, and it guides your people and gives them a compass for how they do their work day to day. So for example, if one of our values as an organization is extreme customer service, and I'm an employee, and right now I just got an, a, an email from a client, and I'm also trying to wrap up an internal project that I've been trying to get done. But one of the values of my organization is extreme customer service. I know it is better for me as an employee to reply to that client email and then see that I replied to them within minutes of them sending it to me and then I'll get back to the internal project. Versus if I try to focus on this internal project and wrap it up and next thing I know it's at the end of the day, the client emailed me five hours ago and I just say, oh, I'll get to it tomorrow. That's not in alignment with our values. So when you can state your values, it helps give people, empower, it helps empower your people to make good decisions on how they prioritize their time throughout the day. So it's not just a squishy concept. Also, if everyone in the company knows where you're going, vision-wise, that's exciting. People want to know that they're a part of a company that wants to achieve something and wants to achieve something maybe bigger into the future. It also ensures you're bringing people on board that are in alignment with that vision. You know, if you really want to be a firm that's got, you know, multiple geographic locations and you're bringing on a director of operations that doesn't really have experience in expanding beyond one office, there may be a misalignment there. But if you don't have that vision stated and there's a lack of understanding about that, you're going to end up hiring the wrong person. So I just want to share with you why I think mission, vision, and values are so important. It's not just a check the box experience, but really can help guide what your people do every day and how they make those decisions and actually who you hire, which comes to my next point here. And that's once you've defined that mission, vision, and values, those should be incorporated into everything that you do. You know, your job postings that go on LinkedIn or that go on Indeed or wherever you're posting your, your jobs. Um, Include in there your mission, vision, value, so people can really see what you're all about. Put them into your hiring assessments. You know, if you're not using hiring assessments, we'll talk a little bit um, about that here in our next slide. But this is a fantastic tool and resource to make sure that you're hiring the right types of people. And you need to incorporate your values into those assessments. 
Um, job descriptions are the same way. Use the language from your values, from your mission statement, your vision statement in your job descriptions. So people start to get that nomenclature and who you are as a culture ingrained into their everyday language. And even the performance reviews. Um, my first corporate job, I love that our performance reviews incorporated the values of the organization. Quick poll everyone into your current age so that we know you're still engaged and you can get that CLE. Um, I hope this is anonymous, Jen. People may not want to actually give their age or they might want to. Anyway. Completely anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, or they're proud of it. I'm 65 and proud. Um, so, you know, I feel like um, the way that my first corporate America job did performance reviews was so amazing because it gave my boss the opportunity to rate me on how I was living up to the values of the organization. And it wasn't just a technical rating. So, you know, sometimes you're in a position, even as a lawyer, where you're being held to build hours that you just don't have available. So if you don't have billable hours available, if you don't have enough work available and it's not your responsibility to go out and develop business, how do you still show that you contributed to the organization? And a lot of times you can do that through values or through, through moving the mission of the organization forward, but in an indirect way, right? Like contributing through offering CLEs or education to other lawyers, through getting out in the community and getting the brand out there by educating for Alaris for a monthly webinar or something like that. So I really wanna encourage you all to establish that mission, vision, values, and then incorporate it into everything as much as you possibly can. And then I think, you know, actively reminding your teams about that mission, vision, values, it's really important that it stays um, not a check the box uh, exercise that it's in every single one of your firm meetings. If you do a, a monthly firm meeting or weekly firm meeting, um, if, if you're sending out an email even to your client base, you know, including your mission, vision, values there on your website, actively reminding people, here's who we are, here's what we do, and here's how we go about what we do and what's really important to us. It's going to attract not just people, but also clients to you as well. And the last point I wanna make about culture is once you've activated your people, they become your best recruiters. Offer referral bonuses. Um, get your people involved in hiring. Create a hiring committee. Let your people, management and non-management, be involved in the interviewing process and to give some sort of input into the hiring process. Engaging pe your people in your culture and then becoming your best advocates for your culture are going to help save you so much time and money in the long run when it comes to recruiting. So I wanna take a few minutes to focus on some technical aspects of recruiting that I think will make your lives easier. Um, and so the very first one is mapping your values and your culture. So when your job postings are frankly dry in a template you just pulled offline and it really doesn't say much about who you are, you're really not putting your best foot forward and trying to show candidates, hey, we're a great place to work. Here's why. And here's what you would be hoping to do here. And here's how we're all aligned and what we're hoping to achieve together. When your job postings have a little bit of energy, you know, a little bit of excitement, you know, incorporating here's what's important to us, you're going to get more applicants where those things are also important to them. Um, I want to give you a couple examples because um, continuing to say like culture without technical examples, I want to make sure just that we're all on the same page. So for example, if one of your values is that you deliver on time and on budget, right? You want to be bringing people into the organization that are organized, that know how to meet a deadline. When you value organization over creativity, you wanna make sure you're hiring people that are highly organized and not leaning towards the creative. And it also could be the vice versa. If you're a creative organization and trying to hire someone into a creative or strategic role, you don't wanna get someone who's a highly organized, not so creative, left brain, thank God for those people because they keep us operationally moving forward, but they're not gonna be in a creative role. Make your job postings map specifically to your culture and to your values so you know you're attracting the right people into those roles. 
And I also think like, know the niche areas to post your job. Um, you know, a general like Indeed posting is just not always the greatest way to go about job postings. LinkedIn and doing a formal job posting, you can end up overwhelming your administration just in processing resumes that are irrelevant to the job you posted itself. Consider the type of position that you're actually looking for. Um, and, you know, using industry resources like the Association of Legal Administrators, like the bar, um, your metropolitan bar, your state bar, your county bar. Obviously, that's within our industry, but if you're looking for others like technical expertise, go to DICE. You know, there, there are certain um, specific uh, sites you can be posting your positions on where you know you're going to attract the right kind of people into those technical jobs or those very specific jobs. And then I also think like making a decision around spear phishing versus net phishing in terms of bringing in candidates. And let me tell you what I mean by that. You might have a position. I, I saw someone the other day reached out to me or posted something about um, someone that's looking for a legal assistant slash uh, marketing associate. Those are not the same thing, my friends. <laughs> A legal assistant and a marketing associate, what's going to happen is you're now net fishing. So you think you're looking for a legal assistant and a marketing associate in the same person. But what you're going to end up getting is a bunch of marketing people applying for a job that can't do the legal assistant work and a bunch of illegal assistants that apply that are looking for the marketing associate work. It is a common practice in law firms when you need, you have a need for talent um, to think about just hiring a person instead of considering outsourcing or hiring part-time people. In that instance, I would do one of th two things. I would hire a part-time legal assistant and a part-time marketing associate, or I would outsource my marketing and hire a full-time legal assistant and not expect them to know anything about marketing. We do ourselves and our people a disservice when we try to net fish. It's better to know exactly what we're looking for, create a job posting that is exactly what we're looking for, um, and that spear phishing approach is gonna get us a more closely aligned candidate and not overwhelm our administrative process in that recruiting process. Um, I wanna also talk a little bit about pre-assessment tools because these are really important and in, um, in our industry just not commonly used. We've probably all seen those situations before where you know, you hire someone into a role and it's pretty quick, you know, within the first few days, first few weeks that you're like, oh man, I just don't know if this is going to be a good fit because they just don't have the technical skills that you thought they had. I've heard it over and over again. Well, the candidates said all the right things. Trust me, they will always say all the right things and not because they're lying, but because they genuinely believe that about their skills. But those skills have never been tested in your environment with your tools and with your technology. So engaging a technical assessment tool is really important to ensuring people really can do what they say they can do, especially in more technical areas, I think, you know, like um, accounting, for example. But there are even skills under technical associated with customer service and how would they be on the phones when they're answering, typing. What's the accuracy of their typing? What's the speed of their typing? Especially if they're gonna be in a legal assistant role and maybe drafting quite a bit or doing a lot of client communications. Technical and cognitive tests are very important and there are so many out there that you can use. If you do a quick Google search, you're gonna come up with a lot of different ones. Um, and many, many of them are created equally, trust me. They're all pretty much the same thing. Where we get more nuanced is when we're trying to assess for culture, because your culture is yours and yours alone. I've heard, I wanna, I wanna give a quick uh, piece of advice or rather word of caution. Um, the Disc and Myers-Briggs are two very popular brands within uh, personality assessment tools. And they're both incredibly great tools for personal and professional development. The DISC in Myers-Briggs should not be used for assessing people coming into your organization. And I will give you two major reasons why. Number one, they are descriptive, not predictive. So they're describing how someone is at a point in time. 
but they're not going to predict how they will behave in the future. And they're also going to tell you about how that person is wired and to learn more about them as a worker and them to learn about themselves and how you communicate with them best. But those tools are not really going to tell you exactly how they're going to do in that job that you're hiring them for. Reason number one. Number two is in a court of law, the DISC has not been holding up in terms of discrimination testing. So if you have a hiring process, if you don't hire that often, you could end up discriminating against someone by using the DISC to not hire them. And especially if they're in a group that's a protected class, you don't wanna use the DISC as a decision-making tool um, whenever you're hiring someone. It is a personality assessment that describes how someone is today, but doesn't really map to how they will perform in the job that you're hiring them for. So what I would suggest are there are two different tools that are very similar in nature called the culture index or the predictive index. Those are two just examples of a cultural assessment in which they can actually take and assess your people. You can tell them, here are my high performers, you know, here are my low performers, here's the middle of the road, here are the people that are successful within our organization. And they actually put this assessment out and come to you and tell you, hey, here's what your culture looks like. Here are the competencies of the people that are most successful in your organization. So then when you start to hire people and give them that same assessment, you can see, are they exhibiting some of the same traits as the people that are most successful within your organization? More likely to be successful, more likely to stay, right? More likely to be hiring the right people. If your assessment process tells you that you need people that are highly organized because you are a deadline-driven organization, you want to be hiring people that are comfortable with timelines, project management, and organizational skills. If you get someone that's a people person and creative and strategic and a broad big picture thinker, they're not likely going to be successful in your organization that's deadline driven. Now, if you need someone in marketing that's creative and strategic, that's different than if you're hiring a lawyer that you need to be organized, deadline driven, and be able to hit results and timelines. So when you're looking at candidates, before you would give them a job offer, I highly recommend that you look into some assessment tools that you can utilize to better understand their work style, their technical skills. It gives you multiple layers of feedback instead of just your judgment based on the interview. And then the last piece I'll mention on hiring strategies is kind of what I alluded to earlier, where a lot of times our hiring is a fire drill. We have a need we jump to the need, we bring our hose, and we try to put it out as quickly as possible. Strategic pipeline building can help you not have that fire drill so often and help you be prepared to be able to get talent plugged in to the positions that you have available when they become available. So right now, be reaching out to connect with lawyers or with legal assistants that you think might be a great fit for your organization, but maybe you don't have a need right now. Just the other day, I reached out to someone that I'd talked to over a year ago that did legal accounting. I'm like, hey, we talked a year ago. How are you feeling? Are you available? Are you interested? What's going on in your life? That person was interested. I am interested. Oh my gosh, it's so good to hear from you. So that person's been in my pipeline for the last year. I didn't have a need a year ago, but I had one today. The more you can build that pipeline and try to maintain those relationships with those individuals, when the need comes available or when they're ready to make a move, um, you can fill those positions a lot more quickly than having to start from ground zero. I haven't seen any open questions yet. I thought I would just take a quick minute just to pause. We have about 20 minutes or so left, 15 minutes left in the session. So another quick reminder, if you have questions, jump in and I'm always happy to chat after the fact so I can provide my email address. Um, real quick, answer the poll for everyone. All right. All right, I wanna talk a little bit, I'm gonna wrap up our session here in the last 15 minutes about brand, the importance of brand and a digital presence. Um, and onboarding best practices, and then talking about consistency in your culture. So as we jump into brand, you know, I will say, 
I found since I started Legal Back Office, it's been almost two and a half years now, actually. Um, I hear pushback from lawyers quite a bit. And I think that's because when you're in a primarily referral based practice and you're used to getting many of your clients through referrals, you don't see the value, at least not on the surface, of being engaged online um, and specifically social media. Well, my website doesn't really matter. Me doing things on social media doesn't matter. That's not how I get my clients. And what I like to really encourage um, people to think about, and I'll encourage you all today, is many times your online presence isn't about your potential clients. It's about your future employees and your current employees. Um, it's also about verification of your professionalism and your trustworthiness as a brand to those referrals. There are many statistics. I teach a whole session on managing your online reputation. And did you know that when people get a referral from a friend that they know and trust, that if they go online and look at reviews and see negative reviews, they are more likely to not actually use that service provider based on online reviews because they trust the negative online reviews over their friends that referred them. That, if that's not scary to you, it should be if you don't have any online reviews or if you have some negative ones. What that tells me is that digital presence really does matter. So if you're thinking my website doesn't matter because I'm in a referral-based organization, um, your website matters. What you look like online. People wanna know that you're still an active business. And if your website's too outdated, it doesn't need to be fancy. You don't need to spend $10,000 on a site. That's not what I'm advocating for. But if it looks like you built your site in you know, 1998, or if they can't find a Facebook profile for you or an Instagram or at a minimum, a LinkedIn profile, or they go to your LinkedIn profile and nothing's been updated since 2012, they're gonna start wondering, are you even still in business? Maybe this is an old referral from someone that my friend worked with a long time ago. The other thing is when you actually engage online, um, on social media, for example, you give your potential employees the opportunity to see who you are. To see your mission, vision, values is not just plunked on that job posting or plunked on your website, but if they can go to your Facebook page and they see pictures of your people and their kids and cats on Halloween in their cute little costumes, <laughs> If they see a potluck where you all got together, or they see that you posted an educational video, or you posted a, a funny video celebrating National Happy Hour Day and everyone's cheersing over Zoom for a happy hour, it's telling your potential employees something about who you are as a brand. If you have no presence, they can't gather that at all. Just think how powerful it is when you see a video from a current employee on a Facebook page talking about how much they love working for that employer. And that brings me to my next point. <laughs> talking the talk and walking the walk is so important when building brand credibility as an employer. If you wanna put this out into the world that this is who you are, then you have to actually be who you say you are. And we know we're in an industry where word gets around, especially when you're in a smaller market. Um, especially if you're in the same practice area. People tend to know all the lawyers. And you all know, in mediation, you know the people doing mediation. You know all the people doing ADR. You can actually say the good ones from the not so good ones. Am I right? I'm right. Just like we can say brands that we know and love and brands that we don't know and love. You know, It's important because the word is gonna start to get around if people start working for you and you portray yourself as one thing and then you're something else that that's not gonna be a good thing for your reputation long-term. I'll give you a really good example. Work-life balance. I love this example because in HR, a few years ago, like 10 years ago, this was such a buzzword and it's kind of stuck around today, a work-life balance. Everybody wanted a work-life balance. The problem is that how you define work-life balance and how I define work-life balance might be two completely different things. And if we want to attract employees that want a work-life balance, so we're going to start saying we have a work-life balance, someone starts with your firm and you don't have a work-life balance, 
Well, then that's going to create a contrary opinion to what you've put out there as an as a brand, and now you've lost all credibility. Defining well, what does work life balance mean? It means at our firm, we allow you to set your target bill by hour goal, and we provide you with the salary that you'll be paid for that bill by hour goal. And if you would like to bill less than that, then you can go to less than that, and here's what your salary will be at that level. So you can set what work life balance means to you. I'm going to be paid this much to build this many hours. And that's just an example. Or if you say, oh, we have a flexible working environment, but yet people kind of are watching you and rolling their eyes if you get into the office after eight o'clock or if you leave at four, that's not really a flexible working environment. Now, I realize I'm talking to a group of people in the middle of a pandemic in which we've all had to learn how to be flexible, right? But all I'm saying is, If you're going to put it out there who you are as an employer, then you have to not just say this is who we are, but you have to actually live that out as well. And then I think active engagement is incredibly important with your current team members on selling your brand as an employer. I mentioned earlier referral bonuses. You know, the cost of recruiting is incredibly high. I'm a very big fan of using external recruiters to hire, especially for lawyers and recruiters that are in this industry because they've been building that pipeline for years of candidates. They will find much better candidates much faster than you starting from scratch. If you don't have the funds for a recruiter or you just can't bring yourself to pay it, offer something smaller but still substantive to your employees to refer their friends into the organization. Create an alumni program of former employees, assuming that they had a good experience and you've always had a great culture. I think keeping people talking about you as an employer is incredibly positive. I'm going to tell a really fast personal story because I think it's incredibly meaningful and supports what I'm saying. And this just happened this week. Um, My very first corporate job uh, was a really great experience. I was there a little over six years and I just got put on this Facebook messenger group chat with like 60 of my former coworkers from that company. Um, it was a negative circumstance why we all got connected. A, a, co- a coworker of ours uh, was having a health struggle and passed away. And what this did is it allowed this group of people that created this common bond through this work situation to all get reconnected, even through a difficult circumstance. Everyone was talking about loving the days that they worked there and how grateful they were for this gentleman that had passed and like how grateful they were for the team and the time that they had there. And and that is incredibly powerful. Now we've got this little alumni group that is constantly going to be saying good and positive things and driving others into that organization to help that recruiting process. So engage your people as much as you can to do some of this work for you and bringing in candidates even. Um, And then lastly, I think incorporating your team into your digital presence is really important. I mentioned a little bit ago about, you know, putting your team uh, in a video online, even if it's a small, simple, funny video or celebrating, you know, Halloween, something on social media, you've got pictures of people's pets in costumes and their kids in costumes. Um, Or maybe it's National Ice Cream Day and everyone in your firm or a handful of people are sharing their favorite type of ice cream from a local creamery in your area. You can tag those creameries, you can tag the individuals if they'd like you to, putting a picture of them or the logos up, showing people and incorporating your team into your digital presence all goes towards building that brand as an employer. Um, And your potential clients, by the way, end up seeing that too. And that's meaningful to them because those are the people that they're going to be working with on a regular basis. So next I want to just talk about some onboarding best practices because, okay, now we've gotten to the point where we've we've, uh, applied some recruiting best practices. We've built that pipeline. We've built our culture. Okay, now we're bringing people on board. Retention, long-term, all hinges on people's satisfaction with the job that they're doing and the employer that they're working for, the people that they're working with, right? But in the short term, people always understand first impressions are everything. It's common to say first impressions are everything. And yet, 
we continue to kind of flub the onboarding process. We think, oh, I'm going to take a breather because now I, I hired the right person. I'm really excited about it. And they show up on their first day and no one knows that they're coming or there's no agenda or they don't have access to the systems that they need or the software that they need. Preparation is key. Make sure communication has happened, when this person is starting, what time they're gonna be there, someone's there to greet them, their equipment is set up, their desk is set up, they've got the software access. There also needs to be an educational process, an agenda, who are they meeting with when mm. to go over what topics? And is there a solid foundation and infrastructure that will allow them to be successful? Processes are really important. And I know it's really easy to dismiss processes in a small organization. When you're bringing someone on board that's new to the organization and you can hand them, even if it's a fairly high level process doc that says, here's how we save documents, where we save them and how we name them for client files. That's one less thing that they have to retain in their mind. They always know that they can go check the second, or here's how we do billing. Here are our billing best practices. You know, we, we round to the tenth, up or down. You know, we block bill. We don't block bill. You know, here's how we do billing entries. Here's how we do notes. If those are all captured in some sort of process doc, then you can leave them behind with something that really helps them to, after the fact, have a reference and a tool that they can go back and check without having to um, uh, check in and ask questions all the time. And I think it really helps them to be autonomous, you know, giving them an agenda, giving them access to the tools, walking them through education, and then giving them time to digest all of that is really important to this onboarding process. And while those technical components are really important to helping set someone up for success, it helps them to get up to speed much quickly, much more quickly too, where they can really start being productive. Um, and even with those technical things, the soft stuff really does matter. Take them to lunch, take them to coffee, or if you're doing remote work, set up a Zoom coffee with them, with the rest of the team. Do a happy hour where you ship out from Drizzly or from Instacart, Total Wine and More. You ship a bottle of wine to all of the people on the team if there's you know a reasonable amount of people on the team. You all hop on a Zoom and you do a welcome John to the team happy hour. I think it's really important that people feel like there's some pomp and circumstance around their arrival into the organization. Or when you do a firm meeting once a month with your people, make sure you welcome the new people and talk about how excited you are that they're on board and how much they're gonna contribute to the organization. Next, last two points is I think, you know, what's really important to the onboarding process is that continual learning strategy. So it's not just a, everything we gave you in your first day of employment, your first few days, your first week, but also how have we created um, an opportunity for that person to continue to learn? I know sometimes starting a new job is literally like drinking through a fire hose. I need, I used to say at my last job, it takes nine months, really solid nine months to feel like you are not just tread and water to try to keep up. The more access they can have to continually learning, not just about your organization, your processes, but also within a specific technical area that they're being hired for, hired for it's gonna help them to stay engaged and be the best possible hire that they can be um, if you help them to continually learn. The last point I wanna make, it's about onboarding, um, but it's also about general culture. One of my biggest pet peeves is when people say it's not personal, it's business. Sorry if you've said that before. I have said it before and I regret it. Um, the thing is, we are people. We are persons. It's always personal, even when it's also business. So people that are coming into your organization, it's always personal. It's always business. When people walk into your door, they're walking in or they're walking onto your Zoom or walking like into your proverbial organization. They're walking in with children that are being homebound, learning, you know, into students. They're walking in with ailing parents. They're walking in with, you know, being in the middle of a divorce. They're walking in with all these things. And I think the more that we can recognize that people are people, in the hiring process, in the onboarding process, and as we're building culture, we are gonna be more likely 
to bring them on successfully when we treat them as a person that is valued as a person and when we create a culture that also continues to acknowledge that they are individuals and people with personal lives, business lives, and let's try to work to perpetuate a culture in which they can be successful with both. Make sense? So I want to I want to leave and sort of end on the cultural consistency. Because I think the single most important factor to retaining employees and keeping them engaged, if we go back to our statistics at the beginning, is their satisfaction, quite frankly. It's are they happy working for you? Because people, especially these days, we're no longer in an environment where people have to keep jobs where they're unhappy. They have options. I mean, even in our environment today, hiring is not slowing. There are still options, especially in our industry. And so culture consistency is incredibly important. It doesn't mean that you don't shift and change over time. But when you know your mission, vision, and values, and it's stated, and then you can embrace that over the long term and people see that consistency to living out that mission, vision, and values, again, your brand as an employer continues to grow and the trust that they have in you continues to grow. And it's really important that we understand what our people really want. What is making them happy? We don't know unless we ask. And it's really easy to make assumptions, especially generational assumptions. And with all the employee satisfactions I've done in my surveys I've done in my career, I can tell you what people want is not generally divided around, along generational lines. Um, it's really important that we don't explain away turnover. We understand what people want. We wanna, obviously within reason, within our mission, vision, values, give them the things that, that they want to keep them happy, keep them employed with us. But whenever people leave, I think it's equally important that we don't just say, oh, well, we couldn't have kept them because they were just never going to be okay with our benefits. Or we never could have kept them because they just don't want to practice this area of law. That's fair. But if they don't want to practice that area of law, could we have figured that out before we even hired them in the first place? I think it's just really uh, a trap for us to explain away turnover that doesn't hold ourselves accountable and responsible for at least considering the role that we could have played in that turnover process. And sure, there are some things we just could have done nothing about, but at least having the conversation with ourselves when people turn over is helpful to ensuring we're creating a good environment which people want to stay in the future. Authenticity, transparency, and just acceptance when things aren't going well is really, really important to continuing to build that culture consistency. Sometimes we just mess up. <laughs> and that just is what it is. As leaders, we don't do everything right. You know, um, it, within a company, we don't always make the right decisions. We make mistakes. People make mistakes. And it means so much more to just say, we made a mistake. We know things are not going well now, but here's what we're going to do to fix them. than just pretending like they don't exist. Sweeping issues under the rug. Or pretending like it's other people's problem. And I also think when people are leaving, we want them to leave better than when they came. So they truly are a voice and a mouthpiece for us, for the positive after they've left. The very first CEO I worked for used to always say that. Um, I really hope that you don't leave, but if you do, I want you to leave better than when you came. And I think there's something very powerful in that statement. What do we have to lose by continuing to help people grow and to learn? While they're with us and our organizations are going to continue to add value to our organization, and if ultimately they go somewhere else, that's good for them too. We shouldn't look at that as a loss, but what we gained while they were there. And I think making your current and, and former employees your best recruiters at the end of the day really is the best way to speed up that process of recruiting and get really good people and also to keep them there. And my last point is that there's no limit to generosity and grace. Whenever we're a bunch of imperfect humans working in stressful environments and trying to create a culture in which people want to come work for us and stay, work, stay working for us, we have to recognize that, that through that imperfect humanity that we're always going to have some bumps along the road, right? We're not going to be able to create a work environment in which every day is rosy. We're just not. We're going to have 
client issues. We're going to have dissatisfied employees. We're going to have some co personality conflicts. And I think the more we can be generous with each other and gracious with each other, I always say, you know, we will only serve our clients at, to the point that we're willing to serve each other. And then creating a culture in which people really like the work that they do, they like the people that they work with, that means we have to have relationship with each other. I'm not saying be best friends or be familial. I'm just saying when people want to work somewhere and they want to work with the people they want to work with, there is a personal connection there. And there's no limit to generosity in, in giving to people and helping them through circumstances and grace and patience and understanding whenever we go through those moments of imperfection. Um, I hope that you all have gained something of value today um, on ideas around culture, ideas around technical recruiting, trying to speed up that recruiting process, hiring the right people. Um, please, I want to make myself available. If you do have any follow-up questions, um, you can contact me anytime. This is my email address and my cell phone number, and I'm just I'm happy to be a resource for you. And I truly appreciate uh, your time. I know that it's valuable, so thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Jamie. And if anyone has any questions, we have a couple minutes left if you'd like to submit them. I don't see any right now, but if they come in, I know Jamie, I'm happy to answer them. Yep. Um, I wanted to say one thing. I emailed you earlier and noticed that your email address is .co, not .com. Oh, I, I don't have, know why. Don't worry. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. I was like, I don't know if I've seen .co. Anyway, um, and I just wanted maybe, to, I did say in the intro uh, a little bit about legal back office, but maybe for some of people that may not be uh, familiar with it, could you say a little bit more about what it is that the services you provide? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we do law firm consulting for small to mid-sized firms that really want to grow um, or want to even launch if they're thinking of starting up a new firm. Um, and we love to start there with consulting and strategic planning, but sometimes there's a need, right, in just uh, outsourcing accounting because managing partners spending 15 to 20 hours a week doing their own accounting services. And so we do outsource accounting, marketing, and HR for small to mid-sized law firms. Goal being, you know, let the lawyers and the legal systems serve the client's practice law and let us run the business side of your practice. And ultimately, you know, it's in our best interest to make sure our clients are successful so that our law firm clients will be our clients for the long term. So we really want to be a business partner that helps you achieve the goals that you're looking to achieve both strategically um, and operationally by taking on some of those um, tasks you don't really need a full-time person to do. Um, and like I alluded to earlier, having a legal assistant be your accountant or your social media manager may not be the best use of resources. <laughs> so we can kind of step in and help take over those things for you. Wonderful. And I know that you have grown tremendously in your, I guess you said two and a half years. And I think that's, it's a tribute to you and all of your wonderful staff. And, and I do think that, you know, walking the walk is like you said, so important. I yeah. can't agree with that more because if you try to be disingenuous, it's going to come out at some point. And uh, yeah, anyway, just thought yeah. that was an interesting point you made. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So I don't have anything else. I don't see any questions. Um, I would just ask, and I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, if you would be willing to come back again next year. Um, I know you have lots of wonderful topics that you present on normally in person, uh, but you are very engaging. And I think one of my favorite things about you is that you are obviously a glutton for punishment, that you surround yourself with lawyers on purpose. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm kidding. But no, you do. You understand the legal landscape very well. And um, like I said before, you genuinely want to, to help and make it better. So um, if you wouldn't mind Absolutely. coming back, we can we can talk about that. Yep. So I'd love to. I'd love to. All right. Well, thank you so much. It looks like we have about a minute left, but um, if there aren't any questions, we will go ahead and we will end the webinar. So thank you. Everyone have a great day. Happy holidays. Same.